Thanks, uh, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm going to be doing an introduction to the context package. So a quick note about myself. Uh, I'm the CTO at Daily Burn. We're a fitness and nutrition uh, workout streaming company. So we do streaming video. Uh, I've used Go for about five years, off and on. Uh, now, I don't get the right code every day anymore, so I still use it for a lot of stuff, but not as much hours in the week. Um, and we've used it for a number of things in our system, uh, queuing, real-time messaging, ETL systems. So uh, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, I wanted to introduce the context package, uh, how to use it, where to use it, and a few of the best practice notes that I've picked up from around the web and the community. So let's talk about the, the problem it's trying to solve for a moment. Um, when you are working with a network server, an HTTP server in Go, uh, every time a new request comes in, it's going to spawn a new Go routine. And Go routines, as you probably know, don't have thread local state. Uh, you're responsible for managing the data that is in, managed in the Go routine, and for the state of the Go routine, things like cancellation, timeouts, uh, when should you exit, should you exit early. Um, and so, as an illustration, you can see if a request comes in and spins up a Go routine, you're typically going to call some number of functions, so you're going to be dealing with data. So how do you handle that in a nice way? So, I mean, the solution that was released uh, by Google was the, a context package, uh, and it was really meant to be a, a way to standardize the approach to solving these problems. So what can it do? Um, it's there to handle request scope data, to handle cancellation deadlines and timeouts. And um, for a really good illustration of some of the use cases that prompted the creation of this package, uh, Samir Ajmani did a talk at Gotham Go 2014 uh, called Cancellation Context and Plumbing. And he ran through in a chunk of that talk a bunch of different examples of cancellation code that existed in their code base before they wrote this package, and how different they were, and some of the problems they had. So it's sort of the root of the original creation. OK, so some context for context. Uh, it was originally announced July of 2014, and it was announced on the Golang blog with a really detailed blog post. If you haven't read it already, I recommend that you start there. Um, and it's meant to satisfy all the requests, or all of the needs that I've already mentioned, but it's also meant to do that in a way that will work across API boundaries and package boundaries. And uh, typically, the use of the context object within your function calls, you should always make it the first parameter when you're, call when you're adding it to a function to support a context. Um, it's treated as sort of a best practice. And most of the code that you're going to find out there that uses context is going to treat it that way. So uh, when it was introduced, it was introduced as under golang.org slash xnet context. So you'd have to go get that package and import it. So yeah, like, like uh, the introduction mentioned, now that Go 1.7 is live as of two days ago, context is now part of, the, part of the core library. So what that means is instead of go getting the context package, you can now just import package. You get it. It's included automatically. If you haven't already looked at using it, then you really should. Um, it, it does a great job of handling the use cases, and I'm going to go through in some detail on, on each of these. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, there were changes made to the net, net HTTP, and OS exec packages to help support it better. And we'll see a, a bit of a demonstration of that, too. So what is it? Um, context type is made up of this interface, which defines a few functions you can use to get values, and I'll, I'll run through that in some detail. And in addition to that, some supporting functions that allow you to instantiate or derive context objects. So the done function, uh, when a context is created, you have the option to create it with a cancellation option. And so this function returns a channel. And if it exists, then you can listen to this channel, select against this, against this channel. And when it closes, that indicates that the context has been canceled. So here's a very simple example, uh, leaving out lots of logic, but showing uh, creation of a, a context with a cancellation function. So you call that, you get back a context object and a cancellation function. If we hit some condition, we're going to call cancel. Now in our do stuff function, we're going to do some actual work, and then we're going to select against this channel. And when it closes, we know the context is exited. All right, error and deadline. So the other, some of the other functions, error uh, simply returns the error object from the context. So in the case that your context exits, you're listening to the done channel. It closes. You can call context at error. That error is the reason for cancellation. And you can return that up the chain where appropriate. Uh, the deadline function is a way for you to check whether a deadline has been set on the context. So one of the constraints you can set on a context is, say, uh, 
I want you to, to cancel at this point in time, no matter what else happens. And calling the deadline function allows you to find out, number one, is there a deadline set? And number two, when is it? So here we're creating a context object with a deadline. You can see it's just expanding upon the cancel uh, creation by adding a deadline uh, time parameter. In this case, I'm just adding five seconds from now. And then in our function, we're going to say, hey, is there a deadline? The Boolean response you get from calling deadline will tell you if one exists. If it does, you can act against it and decide whether you should ex exit early. Do you have a lot of work to do? So you're not going to have enough time? Or have you already passed the deadline? Then you can return. And finally, value. So the context object, object supports uh, request scope data. This is really managed by a values, uh, an, a map underlying the object that you can store values in. The value function is just the lookup for that. So here's a super trivial example. Here's a string. I'm going to store it in the context, and then I'm going to extract it back out. You'll see that I'm casting it. Um, it's stored as an untyped value. So a few notes uh, about values in context. It's uh, stored as underlying, effectively, a map of interface interface. So it's not, it's not type checked at compile time. It's unsafe, effectively. And maybe not in the same way that the unsafe code thing was talked about earlier. Uh, and um, what that means is that you're responsible for knowing what's in there when you extract it, knowing what the type is that you're getting out. Uh, in addition to that, it's good to keep in mind how you should use the values in a context and what things you should store. Because when you have this really convenient object where you can put any data in it that you want right at your fingertips, it's very tempting to just put any data that's relevant to the work you're doing in there. And uh, generally, there's been, I mean, there's been recent talk in the community on Twitter and, and elsewhere about what kind of data should you store in a context. And the consensus is really try to stay as focused as you can on request scoped data. So things like authentication information, uh, header information, um, transaction IDs, things that are truly tied to the life of that request or that operation, as opposed to uh, long running pieces of data that might still be relevant to the work, but which live on beyond that scope. So uh, derived contexts. So when you're creating contexts, what you're really doing is saying, you know, give me a base instance, and then you're adding values and constraints on top of that and creating copies down the chain of execution. So you can add uh, values, timeouts, um, specific cancellation functions. And uh, what you're really doing effectively is building a tree of these contexts. And so the behavior of the cancellation of a context in that um, tree is that if the parent context or any parent context from your current space is canceled, that cancellation is going to flow all the way down the chain. So if the top level context is canceled, the cancellation signal is going to trigger all the way down and roll up the code from the bottom back up. So here's a, there's a few specific functions we can use to derive context. I'm going to go through each of them quickly. Um, so the first is background. This is typically what you would use at your main scope, at your top level scope. Uh, and all it returns is a non-nil context, no constraints, no timeouts. And you can use that to, as the parent for anything you're going to add. Uh, another sort of base level construct is the, the to-do function. This uh, is really more of a placeholder. So if you're writing code, you know you need to have a context. For instance, your, your function signature requires a context to be the first parameter or something like that. You don't, but you don't know what it's going to be yet. You can use context.to do to represent it. And my understanding is that they added this as a way to refactor code within Google when they first wrote this. So they had a ton of code. They wanted to roll context through all their usage of all their APIs. This was a good way for them to do it. And then they could automate that process a bit. Next, with cancel. So we've seen examples of, of most of these already. Um, so with cancel, you're going to give it the parent context. You're going to get back a copy and a cancellation function. You can call that function ex explicitly to tell the, the context to, uh, to cancel itself. Similarly, with deadline, is just an expansion upon that. You add, call it with a parent context, with a deadline time, you get back a copy along with the cancellation function. And the dynamic of that uh, context will then be if you call the explicit cancel function, it will exit. If its deadline expires, or if its parent's deadline expires, then it will exit, or rather signal cancellation. Uh, next, with timeout, this is really effectively like a convenience wrap around deadline. So it's the same as creating a context with a deadline and saying time dot now plus the duration you pass in. So you have a time duration if you want it to expire in five seconds. In the example I used a few slides back, you could call that with timeout and ignore the time dot now add 
And then finally with value, this is the inverse of calling dot value. You're just asking for a copy of that context back where you're storing the value with the key given. So that's a really fast run through of the functions that you can use in the, the interface. Uh, I think it's much better demonstration to look at an actual example. So we're in a little tiny app. It's a search engine with a new twist on search. And here it is. It's DuckDuckGopher. And uh, you probably guess why it's named that. I, I didn't write an actual search engine for this. Uh, and uh, yeah, so let's, let's have a look. So what does it actually do? Um, so I'm a user. I go to the search page. I type in a search query. And I get back a set of results. Uh, I have to have a user account. It's a very exclusive search engine. You can only join it by, by invitation. And uh, our cutting edge innovation is to also show an animated GIF. So you know, in case the search results aren't informative enough or entertaining enough, we can add something to the, to, uh, the visualization. So how does it actually work? Um, so here's a, a very simple illustration. The user types in a query. The search request is sent to the web app. Uh, we verify that you have some authentication, and then we make calls to the DuckDuckGo API and the Jiffy API, and then we return the results to the browser. So I'm going to walk through the app uh, piece by piece. So we have a web server, uh, a session package, and a lookup package. So the web server is implemented in app.go source file. Uh, it houses our main function and our HTTP handlers. So this is, a, I mean, an overly simplified structure for web application. Um, and we have these sets of handlers. For authentication, we have login in, login out, and authenticate. Uh, for search, we have our home page and our actual search action. So the login action is very simple. Uh, there's a templates variable containing the templates preloaded from our templates folder in our application. We just call execute on that with the name of the template to render the page. Uh, on the other side, we log out. We're effectively just deleting the record in our session. So our session package implements this delete function. We're giving it our, our response provider, our request, and our store, and we're removing that value from the session. And then finally, authenticate uh, expects the values of the, the, the sign-in form, which is going to have an email and a password. It will verify that those are valid, and then we'll save it to our session. So very simple. So here's our session package. Uh, here's the two functions we've seen so far. We have our session save and our session delete. And under the hood, this is using the Gorilla Sessions library to do the cookie store management. Um, and we have a, a from request function that we, is written in this package that just loads the current session value from the request. Uh, if it's valid, then we store the value that we were given. If it's not valid, we return an error. Similarly for deletion, if it's valid, we remove the value and vice versa. OK, so a couple other helper functions in the package. Uh, we have an email lookup. This will just grab the current stored value of the email from the session. And we'll use that a little bit later when we're talking to some of the APIs. And uh, a from request, which is simply a, a lookup for the session. OK, so now we have some actual context-related functions. Um, so what we, we want to do is we want to use the session data when we talk to our APIs. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to store the session value on the context object that we pass it. So what you see here is a sort of the, the recommended pattern for how to store values and retrieve values. Um, and uh, the reason that we're doing this is that, if, so you, if you have a look here, we're defining a, a private type and a constant to rep represent the value of the key. Um, the reason we're doing that is to avoid key collisions. So I mean, there's nothing stopping you from taking the context object and just storing any value you want in there, keyed by some string, uh, some string literal, or some string constant in your program. Um, the issue you may run into is that as more and more libraries have access and use of the context library, you can risk uh, collisions with the keys. So this helps uh, avoid that. And now we have our two uh, functions. So one is, the, is adding the value to the context. The other is one is extracting to the, the value from the context. Very simple. Um, the first one, new context, simply calls with value to add the value, return the new copy. The second one uh, takes the context and extracts the value from it and returns it. OK, so the, web ser the, uh, the home action and part of the search functionality. Home action is quite simple. We're basically going to say, OK, let's, we have a request. Does, is there a valid session? Is there a valid user? If there is, great. If not, re redirect to the login. If, and um, then we just put the value of the user into a, a parameters map and render it in the template. And now this is the real work of the application. So the search function 
is going to take whatever I've typed in, uh, make requests to the third-party APIs, and return the results, which sounds very simple. And we're going to add a few constraints to that to make it a little more complicated, but also demonstrate how we can use context to help manage this kind of flow. So the first piece is just like the last action. We're just checking authentication. Let's get the session, the user, if it's valid, great. And then we're going to pull the query data from the form that we posted. So now something with some real meaning. Um, we're going to create a context with a timeout of two seconds. So we're, we're setting a very high bar for performance here. We want to, if we don't get it, anything back from our third parties within two seconds, we're just going to give up and tell you, hey, sorry, we, we couldn't find it. Um, so we have that context with a cancellation function. Now, we're going to create a custom uh, type within the scope of this function called result in error. Uh, it returns, it's got two, two parameters and a, a slice of strings and an error. And then we're going to make the calls out to the two uh, sub APIs. So what we're going to do is create a response channel for each of them. And then we're going to run them both in anonymous uh, Go routines. And we're going to make calls to the API to get the results back. And when we get the results back, we're going to send them back on those channels. So you can see the DuckDuckGo query. We're making a call to our DuckDuckGo lookup uh, function, and we're passing in the context and the query value. Similarly, for the Jiffy API, we're making the same kind of call. But in addition to the context that we initially created, we're going to add the session value to the context so that we can make use of it when we're calling the API. And then we call Jiff for terms with those values, and we get back the result. And finally, we're going to run uh, a, a loop against a select to basically say, OK, let's listen to these three sources and decide what we're going to do when we get them back. So the first one we're going to respond to is the answer channel from DuckDuckGo. And we get the results. We verify that there's something in them. If not, we put a placeholder in. And then we call cancel. So why are we doing that? So we decided that uh, because we're a search engine, the text results should be more important than the animated GIF, even though that's pretty cool. Um, so when we get a result back from DuckDuckGo, we're going to call cancel, and we're going to immediately return. And when we do that, if we've gotten results back from Jiffy already, great, we'll show them. And if we don't, we'll show a placeholder image. Next, we listen for the, the Jiffy uh, response channel. And when we get that value, we just set it. And finally, we listen for the cancellation. So this, canc this listening on the done channel is how we'll trigger against the, uh, the deadline. If the deadline expires, then we're going to exit immediately and return a default value. And then finally, we're going to create a simple parameter map, render that as part of the template so we can display the results. And then we will, here, here's, an exi here's the chunk of uh, template code that shows the results. If we, if we have a GIF object, we'll show it. If we don't, we'll show a placeholder. And then we're going to render in a list the items that we get back from our DuckDuckGo API. OK, so we have a search function. It's going to go off and ask for results. And when it gets it, them back, it's going to display them. So um, how are we actually getting that information? So we have a couple different functions. The first is duck.query. So here we're doing basically the same pattern as we just saw. We're creating a response and error type uh, with a slice of strings. And then we're creating a response channel. And we're calling that on an anonymous Go routine. And in there, we're going to say, OK, let's, let's talk to the, the duck.go HTTP API. And when we get a response back, we'll say, hey, let's check the deadline. And if the deadline is expired, we'll just return, because we're going to do some work afterwards. And we don't want to wait too long to return. So if not, then we're going to combine the results into something we can display. And we send that back on the response channel. And then we're going to select against those two values. So we'll select against the data channel we're going to send responses back on, and also the context.done uh, that will indicate whether it's been canceled. Now, you might have noticed something. The, the after deadline here is kind of redundant. I put it in as a demonstration, but in, in practice, you don't really need it because you've already fired this off in a Go routine and you're already listening to this done channel. So when that exits, you're still going to return immediately. OK, now for the Jiffy API. We're going to call Jiff for terms. And also, I don't know if Jiff or GIF is the way to say it here or not, so I'm just using one. <laughs> uh, we're going to call Jiff for terms. and. Uh, First, we're going to check the deadline and see if it expired. If it has, we'll return. And then we're going to, now we're going to use the value that we put into the, the session, into the context from the session. So the GIF API has a parameter for ratings, which is basically like movie ratings. So you can get GIFs that are rated G or PG or PG-13 or R. And 
For some users, some of those writings might not be the right idea. So we decided that if we know that the user is authenticated, let's use that information to decide what content is OK to show them. So here we're calling our session function from context. So that's just going to extract the session from our context object. Once we have it, we're going to call rating for user. And that's going to say, OK, what do we know about? We have a session for a user. What do we know about this user? Let's decide what content is OK to show them. And we'll return the rating string that matches that. Now, we're going to build the information we need to call the Jiffy API. So we have, we have the original terms that we were, we were given in a terms uh, array. And we combine those with, with uh, plus signal or plus uh, characters so that we can send them encoded to the API. And then we build a simple map that has the API key, the term string, the rating, and we call the get jiffy function. When we get a response back, we parse it, uh, parse the JSON, and then we return a URL value from it. That's what we're going to use to display in, in the page. And here's just for reference is the after deadline function. It's really just doing exactly what we saw before. We're just grabbing the deadline, verifying that it hasn't already been passed, and then move on. All right, so here's get jiffy. So you can see, if you look at this, that we're not doing anything or with Go routines. We're not selecting against a cancellation channel. Uh, we're just making a call. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, I'm using the context HTTP fun uh, package to get sort of push that responsibility off my code and into something that can already do it. So we'll walk through this really quick, and then we'll take a look at that. So all this function is really doing is saying, you gave me a bunch of parameters that you need in your query string. Let's build a query string, add it to our request URL. And then let's call create an HTTP client and call context HTTP.get with those values. So what is context HTTP? So uh, context HTTP is another package. Uh, I believe it was written by Brad Fitz. Um, and it, it adds support for context as a first class parameter in making all these client HTTP calls. And I'm pretty sure the reason that exists is because uh, they promise not to change any of these APIs, so they can't add context parameters to the underlying uh, HTTP get and post calls. Um, now, there is, they have basically sort of solved for this in Go 1.7, and I'll show in a second what I mean by that. But uh, that's the reason it originally existed. So what is it doing? It's doing a very similar pattern as what we already saw. And really, this is where I kind of got the pattern from. Um, so it creates a cancel function. It has, they actually wrote a canceller. Um, and, specific to this that they could use. And then it creates a response and error type, creates a channel, runs an anonymous Go routine, and says, OK, go get the information, and then return it on this channel. And finally, select against the cancellation channel. So it's doing exactly what we were already doing. So here's context HTTP in Go 1.7. Um, you can see it's no longer doing any of this juggling. Uh, it doesn't need to run any Go routines. doesn't need to select against the done channel. All it's doing is calling client.do with request Request dot with context. So there's the addition in 1.7. 1.7 uh, has added context object into the net HTTP to support uh, the, the context values being set on requests. And then under the hood, they're looking at those context objects and handling them. And I, I looked a bit through the code in this, and I thought about using an example from it, but it, it gets like pretty complicated pretty fast. It starts to go a, lot, a little more lower level. It wasn't great for slide presentation. So. OK, so let's see what it looks like when we actually run this. Oops, sorry. Where can I get to my thing? Oh. There we go. OK, so here's our, our duck.gopher. So I'm, I'm from Canada, so I'm going to type in Canada and see what it gives me. Oh, I must have killed it. <laughs> Sorry, here. I, uh, I got a little aggressive with canceling all of my programs that were running in the background because uh, I didn't want to get emails popping up during this talk. It's really hard to look at that other screen and type. I apologize for this, guys. Uh, here we go. 
draw that again. All right, so this is Canada. Here's a few research results. Here's an animated GIF of a guy singing the national anthem at the Vancouver Canucks game, which I think cut off a little bit early because this is the one where you might have seen it when it happened. Uh, he was singing the national anthem about halfway through. He bailed really hard and fell on the ground. And then the entire arena started singing the national anthem, anthem for him while he tried to find the microphone on the ice. Uh, let's see what else we got. So, oh, helps if I helps if I type it correctly. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> I don't know how that's London. Thanks, Jiffy. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that's everything I had to to run through today. Uh, thanks very much.